In this video we're going to be considering colours in the human eye. It's in the How Do Glasses Work topic of everyday physics. In this video we're going to be considering colours and how the human eye works because glasses basically correct for problems within the human eye. So we've seen before that light with different wavelengths has different colours. So red light has a slightly longer wavelength, about 700 nanometers, than blue light, which is around about 450 nanometers. But why we see it as colors actually comes down to how the light is perceived within our brain. So let's start by considering exactly how the eye works. So the eye has lots of important pieces. One of these important pieces is the pupil. So the pupil can open and close to determine how much light it lets in. So on a bright sunny day, the pupil closes and people's eyes look very light. We see a lot of their iris and a lot less of the pupil. And so this lets a lot less of the light into our eye. And then when it gets dark at dusk time, our pupil opens right up to let more light into our eyes which is why people's eyes look a lot darker in the evening because you can see a lot more of their pupil and a lot less of their iris. Once the lights pass through the pupil, it goes into the lens. So the lens works just like the converging lenses that we've seen and it focuses the light onto the retina so that we get a good image of what we want to see formed on the retina. So the retina is at the very back of our eye and we'll be looking at the cells which are on it in more detail in a little minute. It's got the rods and the cones on it which send the signal from the retina to our brain which interprets the image which it gets and that's how we actually see. So let's have a look at Joe explaining in more detail the physics behind how the eye actually works. Joe's going to compare how the eye works to how a camera works. In this chapter, we look at the eye. We'll need a little anatomy and physiology, but we'll concentrate on the physics. In function and structure, the eye has some similarities to a camera, but many significant differences. So we'll compare and contrast them as we go through. Let's start by following a beam of parallel rays of light. The rays enter the cornea, a bulge filled with fluid called the aqueous humor, then pass through the pupil, then the crystalline lens. After this, they traverse a sphere of gel called the vitreous humor to reach the retina, which is the light sensitive layer at the back of the eye. In an eye with normal vision, the refracting power is just enough to focus an image of a distant object on the retina when the focusing muscles are relaxed. Here's a difference between an eye and a camera. A camera is full of air, while the eye is filled with fluids that are mainly water. A camera usually has one or more glass lenses, with refraction occurring at most of the glass-air interfaces. In the eye, most of the refraction occurs at the highly curved surface of the cornea. The refractive index of the lens is only a little greater than that of the media either side, so it contributes only about a third of the refracting power. This explains why we can't focus underwater without goggles. In a camera, the lens moves so as to make focused images of objects at different distances. The eyes of fish and snakes also change length for this purpose. The human eye is different from both. To change focus, we change the shape of the crystalline lens. This is called accommodation. As we age, the lens becomes stiffer. For many of us, this means we can no longer focus on close objects and we have to wear spectacles to reduce the combined focal length to the value needed for reading. So as we've seen, the brain is really, really important for determining what we see. So a really interesting experiment, which has been run a few times by different people, is to wear upside down glasses. 
So upside down glasses flip the image that we see. So you may want to think about what type of lens shape could achieve that. And what they found was that if people wore the upside down glasses for a day or so, they saw everything as upside down, not surprisingly. But if you wear the upside down glasses for a longer period, like three to five days, your brain starts to compensate. And after five days of wearing the upside down glasses, everything suddenly looks the right way up again. And then if you take the upside down glasses off, everything looks upside down again because your brain has been compensating for the upside down glasses. So that was a really interesting experiment which just shows how important the brain is in interpreting what we see. So like the upside down glasses, normal glasses just work by compensating for the problems in our eyes. So if you go to an optician, they'll look at your retina and they'll look at how light passes through your eyes and from this and from your observations about what images look like they can work out how best to compensate for the distortions which happen in your lens or in the other parts of your eyes and so the glasses just make sure that you have a nicely focused image on the back of your retina. So how we actually see colours is because of cone cells which we find on the back of our retina. So most humans have three types of cone cells. We can detect blue, green and red light. Colourblind humans only have two of these cone cells. They don't have the third cone cell. So colourblind humans can't actually tell the difference between red and green. Birds, on the other hand, tend to have four cone cells. So they have one which also works in the ultraviolet region. So they can see a whole new range of colours that as humans we cannot interpret or see. So in humans the cone cells are responsible for determining the colour of objects. We also have rod cells which are important for determining the intensity of objects. So our rod cells work really well at dusk when there's a lot less light getting to our eyes. They let us see the outline of figures even though we can't interpret so much about their colours. So some animals such as cats have a lot more rod cells than humans do in their eyes. And this is why cats are very good at seeing in very low light levels because those rod cells are especially useful in low light levels. They're very good at working out where the boundaries of objects etc are. So let's have a look at Joe explaining more about wads and cones now. In most situations light is focused to form an image on the retina. If anyone were to look at the image on the retina they would notice that it is inverted. The retina has roughly a hundred million photoreceptor cells. These are connected to retinal ganglion cells which respond to incoming light by outputting binary electrical pulses which we call action potentials. Directly behind the pupil is a region called the fovea, a region with high concentration of photoreceptors. Photoreceptors with this shape are called cone cells. They come in three different varieties. One variety is the most sensitive of the three to long wavelengths. We call these red cone cells. The cells themselves are not red, rather they respond strongly to red. What we call green cone cells are the most sensitive to medium wavelengths and blue cone cells to short wavelengths. Cone cells give us our colour vision. Cones are concentrated in the fovea so our central vision has the best colour sensitivity. We'll return to colour vision later. Photoreceptors with this shape are called rods. Rods are sensitive to the whole range of visible light. For this reason, they don't contribute to our colour vision. Note that in the human eye, the nerve fibres connecting photoreceptors to the optic nerve are in the front of the retina. Light must pass through them to get to the rods and cones. Cameras, the electrical connections, are behind the photodetector array. So why are our eyes wired up backwards? This is an accident of evolutionary history. The eye has evolved dozens of times independently and in other examples, such as octopus and spider, the nerves are at the back. Where the optic nerve passes through the active layer, 
there are no photoreceptors, so we have a blind spot in each eye. You can measure the angle of the blind spot on the fovea like this. Close your right eye, fixate on the X, then move your head towards the screen. When the dot disappears, the dot and the cross subtend the blind spot angle at your eye. Here's another contrast between your eye and a camera. The image in a camera is usually converted into images that people will look at. Optometrists and ophthalmologists aside, no one ever looks at the image formed on your retina, not even you. For that reason, there is no need to transmit the image through the optic nerve, so some of the image processing is performed in the retina itself, with a compression of about a hundredfold, especially in peripheral vision. Different combinations of cells, adding or subtracting, much like electronic circuits, can detect edges and center surrounds. So let's think about how we see colors in a bit more detail then. I have this sheet of white paper here. Now the white paper looks white to you because it's actually reflecting all the different wavelengths of light. So it's reflecting blue light, red light and green light. So it's activating all the cone cells on the back of your eye and so you perceive this as white. With a black background on the other hand, this reflects very little light. It tends to absorb the light. And so it's not sending red, green or blue light towards your, the cones in the back of your eyes. So you see this as a lack of colour and your brain interprets that as black. This green leaf absorbs the red and blue light and reflects the green light. And so your eye perceives this leaf as green. So this means that the green light is actually the relatively useless light for the leaf. If you tried growing green leafed plants under green lights, they wouldn't grow very well because they wouldn't be getting enough energy to photosynthesize. Similarly, my shirt appears red to you because it's reflecting red light and so it's stimulating the red cones on the back of your retina. So now we all learnt about mixing colours back in kindergarten. We saw that it, if we mixed yellow and blue paint, we got green. So this is because yellow paint reflects yellow light, blue paint reflects blue light, and so when we combine them together, we just get reflected that bit in the middle, which they overlap at green, and so we perceive this as green light. Similarly, red and yellow give us orange, Blue and red give us purple. And did you notice when you were in kindergarten, when you tried to make purple, it always looked a lot darker than the other colours? That's because blue and red have very different wavelengths and so there's much less overlap between them. And so we tend to get a much darker colour as there's a lot less reflected light when we mix those two together. Now when we mix lights, we actually get very different combinations of colours. So when we talk about primary colours for mixing light, we're actually talking about red, blue and green. So it's red, blue and green because our eyes have cones which detect red, blue and green light. So in kindergarten you learnt that it was red, blue and yellow, now it's red, blue and green. When we add light colours, we're actually stimulating more cones rather than reducing the amount of reflected light and so they add differently. When we add red and green light we actually get yellow light. So you can look at this picture here where we've got the three light colours coming in and being reflected and you can see where red and green meet it actually looks yellow. Where blue and green meet we get a colour called cyan which looks a bit like aqua blue and where blue and red meet, we get what's called magenta, which is kind of a pinky purpley colour. So when you go and buy inks for your printer, you can get yellow, cyan and magenta, and these three colours add together to give you all the colours when you print. So if you want to know more details about adding colours with light or with 
in the reflective case with paint, you can have a look at Joe on Fizz Clips. I've put the link just below this video. So in this video, we've seen how the eye works and that the spectacles or glasses are really need to, needed to compensate for when there's problems with how our eyes work. So the glasses adjust the focus of our eyes so that we get the image formed on the back of our retina where it's meant to be. We've also had a look at colours and how reflecting surfaces, which is what surrounds us generally every day, and producing lights with different colours actually add in a different way as reflecting colours tends to remove the light, whereas light producers add light. And so add light producers stimulate more of our cones, whereas the reflected light tends to subtract away. So when we add blue, green and red paint, we tend to get black or a very dark colour as very little light is reflected, whereas when we add blue, green and red light, we get white light formed because it's reflect we, we stimulate all of the cones on the back of our eyes. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this. Thanks very much to Joe Wolf for producing Fizz Clips and allowing us to use them. Thanks to Anna Andres Arroyo for taking the photograph of the coloured light rays. And thanks for Fen Fen Chang for allowing us to use his lab to produce the photograph.